But I actually think that what's going on here is that the West is leading Ukraine down the primrose path. And the end result is that Ukraine is going to get wrecked. And I believe that the policy. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what's happening right now. And it doesn't seem like they're going to have a lot of help. It happened. It happened. Russia invaded the Ukraine. And I was wondering, I've been wanting to know um, exactly how did it all get to this point? Where did it all go wrong? How could we have prevented this? Could we have prevented this? What exactly is going on over there? I wanted to get a bunch of information, but then um, as all this news is breaking out, we're starting to get every, we're just getting inundated with nothing but all of this coverage about what's going on in the Ukraine, and we have Russia invading them for strategic purposes. So there's a whole lot going on here. I did a little, I, I was doing a little bit of research and I really enjoyed this lecture that I found and it gave a pretty good idea. I'll put the link in the chat, but uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to go over a little bit from this lecture and see if it makes any sense with what we're seeing right now on television in the news, everything. I just want to see if we're, if there's any explanation as to what is going on, how, how long this is going to last. Is this going to be a long-term thing? Everyone's hyping it up for the new world war three, because all it takes is a little invasion and then people will be fighting. But I don't think that Ukraine is that strategic to everyone's interests. Seems like it's way more, of an interest for Russia than it is anyone else. So I was I found this lecture by John Mearsheimer, and he's talking about why is the Ukraine the West's fault? Is it all our fault? Is the Ukraine all our fault? So I really just wanted to see how this is working out. Where is this going? What is happening? How did we how do we get to this point? So this lecture by Mr. John Mearsheimer, hopefully we'll shed a little bit of light on what's going on here. Just how to think about the geography of Europe. This is a simple, if not simplistic, way of thinking about it. But here's a map. Uh, you can see where Ukraine is. You can see where Poland okay, is. So you can see where Russia is. The way I... Yeah, I do apologize. My camera's in the way. One day I'll, I'll figure out how to take that out. But you can still see Ukraine right there. Um, Russia... Belarus, Poland, Germany, France. See, Ukraine's kind of in the middle of everything, heading on towards uh, Europe. But it is funny that uh, you have the Iron Curtain, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, all of those are former um, Soviet satellite countries think about European security is there's France, Germany, Poland, Ukraine, and Russia. Of course, we're moving from west to east. These are the big kahunes. These are the big countries that matter. And of course, the two countries that matter the most historically are Germany and Russia, or for most of the 20th Which, if we remember anything about World War II, 20th century, Germany, and World War I, and the Soviet and all the biggest wars that have been going on in the past 200, 300 the Union. years. And I put them in red because, as you well know, both Germany and the Soviet Union fought bitter wars in Poland, in Ukraine, and we could add in Belarus as well. Yeah, so the so seeing a little bit of location and everything, it, it gives you, I'm way more of a visual person, so we can talk about all this stuff, but if you visualize, if you visually see it, it helps a lot. If need be. But as we go along here, you want to keep in mind that Ukraine is right next to Russia, and... Poland is right next to Ukraine. And then out further west is Germany and France. Take this a step further. This is the now, the ethnic breakdown is fascinating. This is very fascinating. The ethnic breakdown of Ukraine. I'm going to show you a number of maps, all of which are designed to show you that Ukraine is a badly divided country. And what's taking place inside Ukraine today is in good part a civil war. And to that extent, it doesn't have that much to do with what the Russians or the West are doing there. 
Uh, and as you can see in red uh, are mostly Ukrainian speaking people. And then as you move further east with what the Russians or the West uh, are doing there. Uh, and as you can see in red uh, are mostly Ukrainian speaking people. And then as you move further east, you're talking about uh, lots of Russians and certainly lots of Russians. So more of the West wants to be NATO. More of the East wants to be Russian because they're Russian. Ukraine does not look like it is very stable. Speakers, uh, this is the Ukraine election of 2004. This is the election in the wake of the famous Orange Revolution, which I'll talk more about. Uh, as you can see, the country is badly divided uh, between the East and the West. The Russian speakers in the East and the Ukrainian speakers in the West. This is the 2010 election, which resulted in Yanukovych getting elected. I'll talk about President Yanukovych's in four election. Could enter only one international economic union. Now, this right here. Which of the following from the international 2010 election right. look a lot like the voting patterns in the 2004 election. And then these are two recent surveys that came out uh, from the International Republican Institute that's here in the United States. Uh, this one says, if Ukraine could enter only one international economic union, which of the following should it be? And of course, the blue is the EU, uh, and the light blue uh, is the customs union, or actually the red is the customs union of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. Um, and the cities up at the top are in western Ukraine, and the cities down on the bottom are in eastern Ukraine. And you see a big difference between the east and west. There is such a big separation. So you can see very clearly that people in the West would like to join the EU. People in the East have little interest in joining the EU. And interestingly enough, so we've seen the demographics and you see the demographic breakdown of the United States and you can pretty much tell how people are going to vote based off of the demographics. And this is pretty much what we're looking at here in the Ukraine. And this is why Ukraine is such a mess. No one can get along over there. Russian, or are you Ukrainian? Those are the EU numbers, here are the NATO numbers. I mean, these two charts. And the NATO, NATO, they don't want to do NATO either. Well, the West side does, not the East. They are so split on everything. They are crazy split. Look virtually the same. But all of this tells you that you have a badly divided country. And the conflict between the West and Russia over Ukraine is played out in the context of this situation. This is a simple little view graph that shows Europe's dependent on Russian gas. Now here's a big thing too. When it comes to all of the different economic penalties we try to put on Russia, with Europe being this dependent on Russia, it doesn't seem like anyone else is really in a big position to be doing much. They're getting all of their gas from Russia. So if you really want to have a problem with Russia, if they take their oil away, what are you going to do? What can we do? Yes. It's quite clear from that view graph that many of the countries in Eastern Europe uh, and even countries like Germany are heavily dependent on Russian natural gas. Yes. And of course, that gives the Russians lots of political leverage in this crisis, and it makes and they still have that leverage. So then you hear a bunch of talk about NATO and the EU and all of these different things. And NATO had a declaration at one of their summits in 2008 saying NATO welcomes Ukraine and Georgia's Euro Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agreed today that these countries will become members of NATO. Uh, members of NATO. So, excuse me, the Soviets, the Russians made this perfectly clear. This was unacceptable. Russia's deputy foreign minister said, Georgia's and Ukraine's membership in the alliance is a huge strategic mistake, which will have most serious consequences for pan-European security. So this has been getting pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, and we still hear all of our leaders talking about NATO and how we're going to get our NATO allies to, to come in and, and help them, but it's hard to see it actually happening. Putin himself said, Georgia and Ukraine becoming part of NATO is a direct threat to Russia. So if Putin's been saying Ukraine is a direct threat to Russia if you get your Western allies in here, 
If you get westernized over here in, in the Ukraine, we're going to have some problems. They've been, they've been open about it, but why would we want the Ukraine in NATO ourselves? Interesting. You all remember that there was a war between Russia and Georgia in August 2008? That war was a consequence of this, because the Georgians thought we were sending them a signal that they could get uppity with the Russians, and we would back them because they were going to become part of NATO. That's not what happened. That's, yeah, that does, that's, that does not You know what right. happened. The Russians clobbered the Georgians, and Georgia is in deep trouble today because it thought it, be, it could become part of NATO. So they don't have freedom over there, guys. They are owned by Russia, and Russia will make sure that they get theirs. My argument is you're playing a losing hand. Okay. And the reason you're playing a losing hand is because this is a competition between economic considerations and security considerations. The basic mindset of people in the West is that you can punish the Russians economically and they'll throw their hands up. My argument is when security considerations are at stake, when core strategic interests are at stake, and there's no question, ladies and gentlemen, in Russia's case, this is a core strategic interest, countries will suffer enormously before they throw their hands up. Yeah, and, and with all of the different threats that our president has been making, hasn't stopped them at all, has not stopped them once. Right. So you can inflict a lot of pain on the Russians, and they're not going to quit. And they're not going to quit because Ukraine matters to them. And by the way, Ukraine doesn't matter to us. You understand there's nobody calling for us to fight in Ukraine. Even John McCain, who up until recently has never seen a war he didn't want to fight, <laughs> right, is not calling for using military force in Ukraine. What John McCain is saying is, not, is that Ukraine is not a vital strategic interest for the West. That's what he's saying. It is a vital strategic interest for the Russians. They've made that perfectly clear. And not just Putin. Right? So in terms of balance of resolve, it's all on their side. And I showed you that slide up there that depicted how much economic leverage the Russians have because of all that natural gas going westward. So we're playing a losing hand here. But let's assume that I'm wrong. That doesn't sound very positive. Let's assume that we're playing a winning hand and that we are capable of backing Putin into a corner. And we're getting close to pushing him off a cliff. Is this good? You're talking about a country that's got thousands of nuclear weapons. And the only circumstance, really, under which states use nuclear weapons is when they're desperate, when they think their survival is at stake. So what you're talking about is putting Putin in a situation where he's desperate. And if you go home and Google Putin and nuclear brinksmanship, you'll be reading all the articles that come up for the next two years, right? Because he's making it clear that you're fooling around with his core strategic interests. And again, he's got thousands of nuclear weapons. So you're putting yourself in a position, right? you're putting yourself in a position where you're willing to risk a possible nuclear war over a piece of real estate, Ukraine, that is, a, that is not of vital strategic interest to the United States. Again, it's not of vital strategic interest to us. By the way, and this will be my final point on this, what's truly amazing about all of this is that we were talking about incorporating Ukraine into NATO when we have now acknowledged by not taking military action over Ukraine that it's not a vital strategic interest. You understand that when you incorporate Ukraine... Is that why we're just, we're not actually offering up much, much help more than what we're doing? Just sanction, sanction, sanction? Is Crimea lost to Russia for good? Uh, yep, it's gone. gone. When I give this talk, many people in the West think that there's sort of a deep-seated immoral dimension to my position because I'm blaming the West and not Putin, who certainly has authoritarian or thuggish tendencies. There's no question about that. But I actually think that what's going on here is that the West is leading Ukraine down the primrose path. And the end result is that Ukraine is going to get wrecked. Uh, and I believe that the policy... I mean, I mean, I mean, that's... Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what's happening right now, and it doesn't seem like they're going to have a lot of help. Very, yeah, man, this shit's crazy. See, I'm advocating, which is neutralizing Ukraine and then building it up economically and getting it out of the competition between Russia on one side and NATO on the other side is the best thing that could happen to the Ukrainians. What we're doing is encouraging the Ukrainians to play tough with the Russians. We're encouraging the Ukrainians to think that they will ultimately become part of the West because we will ultimately defeat Putin and we will ultimately get our way. Time is on our side. 
And of course, the Ukrainians are playing along with this. And the Ukrainians are almost completely unwilling to compromise with the Russians and instead want to pursue a hardline policy. Well, as I said to you before, if they do that, the end result is that their country is going to be wrecked. And what we're doing is, in effect, encouraging that outcome. I think it would make much more sense for us to, neutral, to, to work to create a neutral Ukraine. It would be in our interest to bury this crisis as quickly as possible. It certainly would be in Russia's interest to do so. And most importantly, it would be in Ukraine's interest to put an end to the crisis. That is fascinating. And it seems like a lot of this stuff has been built up over time, built up over time. And obviously, this isn't 100% correct. And this isn't exactly what's going on. I mean, there's so many different variables that you can consider that you can't consider, especially with geopolitics and world geopolitics and things like that. The tug of war that the West and the Russians have been doing, the East and the West have been doing with the Ukraine, it looks like it's finally gotten to the point to where he, he called it, I guess he called it months ago or years ago, seven years ago, I believe. Yeah, 2015. He called it. Ukraine is going to get wrecked. And what's happening right now, guys? What's happening right now? I hope that this was informative. I've definitely learned a lot with it. Um, I, I'll say go and check out that, uh, that lecture because it's fascinating. Just getting an, an idea, just a little idea, on how all of this came to be and where it may be going. And, and it seems like it may not quite be World War III in the sense that people are thinking it is because it doesn't seem like anyone else has interests in the Ukraine other than Russia. And Russia is going to go in there and do whatever they have to do. It sucks, but we just have to pay attention, take care of your family, love your family, and um, let's, just, let's just keep an eye on this and see what else is going on with it, because this stuff is fascinating, man. This stuff is crazy. Uh -huh.